Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, Deep Dive, um, Race Equality Deep Dive, Applying an Evidence-Based Approach to Inclusive Recruitment. Uh, my name's Sharon Inkotamia, and um, I'm a non-executive director at Homerton Healthcare. And uh, you can see uh, on my background that there's something that says the CECOL group, because I'm the vice chair of that group, which is the national network for uh, black, Asian and uh, minority ethnic non-executive directors and chairs. But for the next hour and 15 minutes, I'm going to be chairing this webinar uh, talking about this sub subject. So I'm really excited to be here. You are all welcome uh, today. Um, I can see the numbers are slowly creeping up. So there's obviously people still joining us. Um, uh, hopefully there'll be everyone who, who's meant to be here will be here. Um, please note that this session is being recorded. Uh, by NHS providers and you know they've organized this as part of their program on race equality and for those of you who are new to NHS providers you've never been to one of their events before this organization is a membership organization and um, for, for trusts and foundation trusts uh, and helping them to deliver uh, high quality patient focused care by enabling them to learn from each other acting as their public voice and helping shape the system in which they operate. Um, so that's a little bit about NHS providers there. But today we are joined by two fantastic speakers. Um, firstly, we're going to be hearing from Roger Klein, who's a research fellow at Middlesex University Business School. And he's going to be talking to us about recruitment and talent management interventions. And then we've got a case study from uh, Kevin Croft, who's the Chief People Officer at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. Uh, there will be a Q&A session in, after both speakers, so any questions you have, please do uh, make a note of those, and then we'll have some final reflections, and I promise you that we'll close on time. So that's the agenda for today, and um, just to run through some housekeeping, uh, I've mentioned that um, the session has been recorded. Uh, if you can, keep your camera on where possible. And if you do lose connection, do take a note of that email address on the screen, race.equality at nhsproviders.org. That's race.equality at nhsproviders.org. And they, the team there will make sure that they'll you know, get you back on. Um, while we want your camera on, we'd like your microphone off during the presentations to minimize any background noise. And um, yeah, I've mentioned questions already. Feel free to utilize the chat box as well for, you know, commentating or putting questions in there or any, any things you'd like to share. Um, use the hand function when it does come to the Q&A section so we can see when to bring you in. And if we're unable to answer any questions today, we're going to take those away and, you know, get answers to you after the event. And then... The final thing is you will receive an evaluation form and I encourage you to really complete that and return it um, so, you know, NHS providers can know what you felt about the, at the event. So there's just some housekeeping there that I had to, uh, to, to share with you. Um, I'm going to move on to the, to the next slide. And now I'm going to introduce uh, Roger Klein, who's going to be really talking us through what today is all about, um, applying an evidence-based lens to inclusive recruitment. Roger, I'm going to mute and hand right over to you. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Sharon. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Let me start by saying we need to approach workforce race equality the same way, broadly, that we would approach other aspects of NHS decision-making. And that means using research and the best practice as tools of improvement. If a medical director or a nursing director proposed to the board a response to say an infection outbreak, the board would expect them to have the evidence that what they were proposing had a reasonable likelihood of being effective. But unfortunately, that's often not how we've approached uh, tackling discrimination or promoting equality in recruitment and career progression. Uh, I'm particularly delighted that Kevin is here today because at Imperial, the board have shown what can be done when an evidence-based approach to recruitment and career progression 
is systematically implemented with board support. So I want to briefly summarize the challenge we we face and then set out um, the principles that research suggests is the methodology we should use and which a growing number of trusts are using. So next slide, please. I uh, just want to start briefly with four principles. We should base EDI decisions on whether there's confidence that what's proposed has a reasonable likelihood of bringing about the change you want to see. Uh, on average, over time, the outcomes for staff in appraisals, access to stretch opportunities, and in recruitment should be the same for staff, irrespective of their protected characteristics. Policies, procedures, and diversity training may be helpful, but in isolation, there is no research that says they're going to bring about the change we need. And finally, uh, early progress on tackling race discrimination is certainly possible, but sustainable change takes time to embed. Um, Mary Dixon Woods distinguishes between taking a comfort seeking approach to data and a problem seeking approach. The last National Res report showed it was 1.61 times more likely that a white shortlisted candidate would be appointed compared to a shortlisted candidate of black and minority ethnic heritage. The next slide shows how small differences in race discrimination can make a big difference. What, what that means, what this slide shows is what it means for future career progression. If we have relative likelihood at 1.61, say for a band five nurse who is white and a band five nurse who is from BME background, by the time they get through the seven promotions needed to be a very senior nurse, it will be 28 times more likely that the white nurse will get there rather than the BME one. If you're not sure you believe me, work it out in your calculator. Next slide, please. So very quickly, uh, I think you know this, that the current NHS scorecard on, on race in recruitment and career progression, uh, there's not much, been much movement on the relative likelihood of uh, black and white candidates being appointed from shortlisting. It's still twice as likely that BME staff will not believe there are equal opportunities for promotion and career progression compared to uh, white staff. Uh, there is significant improvement in the numbers of uh, board members from ethnic minorities, but it's more so amongst NEDs than amongst execs. Uh, where data does exist, BME staff tend to be underrepresented in very good appraisal ratings and overrepresented in poor appraisal ratings and widely disadvantaged by informal access to stretch opportunities. There are trusts who demonstrate serious improvement is possible, but overall, we still have a serious challenge. Next slide, please. So I've summarized here what I think are the, the key preconditions for improvement in inclusive recruitment and career progression. A clear narrative that's understood by the board. Uh, an alternative model that focuses more on debiasing processes rather than just debiasing people inserting accountability, but in thoughtful ways, it's not a case of beating people up. And thirdly, leaders who are seriously inclusive allies in the way they work. And finally, using an improvement lens, pri lens primarily to drive the change. Next slide, please. So taking those one, in, one at a time, and I'm going to whistle through these, but just pick out the headings. A decade ago, Mary Dixon Wood showed that in hospital settings, managing staff with respect and compassion correlates with improved patient satisfaction, infection and mortality rates, CQC ratings and financial performance. The Messenger report found that there was widespread evidence of considerable inequity in experience and opportunity for those with protected characteristics, of which we would call out race and disability as the starkest. We know from Eden King and others that where organizational leadership better represents the diversity of staff, there's more trust, stronger perceptions of fairness, and overall better morale of staff. We know that demographic diversity improves performance, but only so long as it's underpinned by inclusion. We know that talent is wasted <coughs> if candidates are chosen who fit in rather than on the basis of their potential. <coughs> we know that discrimination impacts on staff, mental and physical health, that it impacts on patient safety, it makes it, it disrupts effective team working, makes people more reluctant to raise concerns, 
and uh, more reluctant to admit mistakes. And of course, it undermines the social justice that is part of our values. And finally, boards should be aware that the forthcoming CQC well-led rating criteria may well attach more importance to the staff experience of EDI. So the narrative is really important and boards need to be confident about that. Next slide, please. Debiasing processes is much more effective than simply relying on debiasing people. There's a wealth of evidence, and some of you may have read some of that. But if I just pick out one quote, I'm going to read it, if, if I may. Uh, landmark 2006 report from Dombin and colleagues, quote, attempt, they found that attempts to reduce managerial bias through diversity training was the least effective method of increasing the proportion of women and people of color in management. Whilst a major 2018 EHRC literature review by my colleague Doi Natural-Argan found that whilst unconscious bias training could increase, uh, could improve cognitive, un cognitive understanding, there's little robust evidence it changed decision-making. Bias creeps into Every aspect of recruitment and career progression it affects how jobs are created, which competencies will be tested, how jobs are advertised, how stretch opportunities are allocated, how appraisals and feedback is conducted, shortlisting done, which how it, it distorts assessment methods, how in, it, it impacts on how uh, interview uh, decisions are made. And it affects how references are written and how CVs are read. And there's a wealth of evidence about that. The good news is that I'm personally aware of NHS organisations acting on how to debias uh, appraisals and feedback, uh, who have uh, stopped the in informal tap on the shoulder to access, access to stretch opportunities, which is a key obstacle to inclusive career progression, improved how jobs are created and advertised. They focus on future potential, not just past opportunities. They use well-structured interviews with de-biased decision-making. Uh, small numbers have started using batch recruitment, for example, in nursing intakes, very effectively, and it could be used in board selection too. Um, they create, some of them create multiple data points to mitigate bias using uh, work samples, uh, in trays, situational judgment tests, as well as interviews. A few really brave ones are removing the future line manager as the prime decision maker. If it's good enough for Google, it might be good enough for the NHS. And there are some examples of it working. And finally, positive action. There's some really good examples of positive action. But we need to remember that positive action can help level the playing field. But unless we challenge the institutional obstacles, it will be very frustrating for people. Uh, next slide, please. Scrutiny changes decision making. Awareness of accountability acts to preempt the introduction of bias into hiring decisions before it happens, helps challenge stereotypes when making decisions. Uh, people who are required to, chat, to justify their decisions to a more senior person are likely to undertake more thoughtful evaluations. Leaders tasked with accomplishing diversity goals were found to be more effective when clear accountability existed. And again, there's some very good NHS examples of applying this evidence that I'm aware of. And I should say that um, finally, the NHS is going to pull together, it's starting to do it, a repository of good practice to stop the ridiculous situation where people have to start informally asking around, does anybody know of a good examples of uh, this, that or, or the other? Um, so these include um, the use of an EDI data dashboard using real-time workforce and annual staff survey drive data to drive improvement, challenging and then supporting local managers in the same way that trust use one to drive clinical improvement. A shortlisting protocol that if staff, senior staff shortlists are not diverse, they have to go out to advert again. Ending informal access to stretch opportunities, monitoring who gets them, encouraging their use as positive action, inserting interview accountability of the sort that Imperial and others have done for both outcomes and to identify support for those from underrepresented groups who've not been successful so they could do better next time. 
ensuring panel challenge, challenge and interviewee feedback and welcoming the use of staff networks to provide feedback and challenge. The next slide, please. And the final precondition is what leaders do. And the evidence, I want to do this in two parts, why it's so important and how it can be done. So the evidence is really very, very convincing and it won't surprise anybody. The evidence of links between psychological safety, positivity, empathy, leadership and innovation is deep and convincing. Inclusive leadership is needed to manage the responses of individuals that arise from social categorization processes, putting all sorts of different people together, and it can enable effective team working in diverse teams. Support from top management is a key factor in determining the success of diversity programs where diversity interventions lack the involvement of top managers and fail to address overall work processes, their long-term effectiveness transforming organizational culture is likely to be limited. And finally, leaders, oh, I've dealt with that one. Next slide, please. So how can this be done? And I have to say, I've seen a real sea change in the last uh, three years, probably, uh, partly driven by Black Lives Matter, I am really now asked about why race equality is important for NHS trusts, but instead I'm asked how we can create it. The best interventions of the world, however, will not succeed unless leaders behave as inclusive leaders. And on race, amongst other things, that means understanding that challenging disadvantages cannot be left to the disadvantaged. We have to be active allies preventing disadvantage, not just responding to it. We have to find ways to have honest conversations about using power and privileges and stop being worried about saying the wrong thing, which results in a conversational car crash when we're talking about race or with uh, black and minority ethnic colleagues. Be clear that inclusion is crucial to sustained uh, improved representation. Modeling the behaviors we expect of others, personally challenging discrimination, supporting accountability, listening uh, with attention, and reflecting that in board member appraisals and through board scrutiny of the EDI dashboard. We, we of course have to delegate operationally EDI leadership to chief people officers and others, but that should, be, should not be a case of dumping it on them and forgetting the board has to visibly lead. And finally, the board boards on race have to understand that relational intelligence, kindness can be just as important as rational intelligence when addressing issues such as discrimination. And don't forget, if we don't know that what the evidence is that support proposed interventions, we should think carefully about why we are undertaking them. We wouldn't do that with any other aspect of NHS decision making. And then on the next slide, I've just this is taken from uh, one trust that's doing all this. Um, using the principle that on average over time, the interview outcomes of men and women, white and BME staff should be about the same on appraisals. There should be a bell curve with equal distribution, irrespective of protected characteristics. And if there's not, there are things you can do to improve that. Stretch opportunities, and it should be monitored. Stretch opportunities, end the tap on the shoulder, uh, and, and insist on accountability for access. And there's different ways of doing that. A number of trusts are introducing talent pools, for example. Uh, on interview outcomes, using what Imperial and a number of other trusts now use, which is to press panel chairs to justify decisions and to put talent plans in place for unsuccessful candidates as a requirement. And finally, crucially, patterns of disadvantage, data-driven accountability is the most powerful way of doing this, using a dashboard to, not as a, a, a way to beat people up, but to enable check, challenge, accountability to support as, a, as an improvement lens. And don't forget that positive action can be really helpful, but on its own, without dismantling institutional bias will have very limited impact. Next slide, please. 
So this is, I'm not, I'm not going to take you through the detail of this, but as an example of a, of a fairly sophisticated and effective approach in one trust that um, before no tick boxes was written, when I saw this, I thought, I actually said to the person who created it, did you get a pirate copy of it before it's published? Because it's exactly the sort of thing that I was arguing for in no more tick boxes. Job de description never analysed for gendered uh, and non-inclusive language. An application form that uses... Uh, that tests candidate responses against four work sample questions. It's then followed by a highly structured uh, blind, blind shortlisting uh, based on candidate answers to those questions only. And from those, uh, an, a set number of people are selected for uh, an actual interview. Uh, the CVs for each candidate are reviewed independent of their answers to the four questions, ranked in order of suitability. And really interestingly, the CV evaluation was found to be quite different to the shortlisting outcomes with candidates assured least in blind shortlisting often being ranked highest based on their CV. Structured interview follows uh, using success profiles, uh, various uh, methods are built in to try and minimize uh, bias. One of them is that the panel members are asked to score each candidate independently without from conferring with an analyst and then put in their scores. And when the interviews and shortlisting are finished, interview scores are weighted 60%, shortlisting scores are weighted 40%. So there's two reference points for marking, which is really important. And the candidate with the highest score, no, nothing else is allowed to enter into it, are appointed by the trust chair. And this trust has found that a very effective way of doing inclusive uh, recruitment. So what? So uh, just the next slide, please. Uh, I'm not going to take you through this, but this is a reminder um, that whilst we want to inc increase and improve representation, we do so not just because we don't want to waste talent, but because inclusion and psychological safety are crucial to really good quality care. And I'm just going to quote the last uh, bullet point, if I may, um, the evidence why this is important. Inclusive and compassionate leadership, research finds, helps create a psychologically safe workplace where staff are more likely to listen and support each other, resulting fewer errors, fewer staff injuries, less bullying of staff, reduced absenteeism, and in hospitals, reduced mortality. That's 15 years ago, it's still true today. So in summary, next slide, please. My last slide. What should boards prioritize if they want to really move the dial on inclusive recruitment and career progression? First of all, we have to make ourselves uncomfortable and then become confident about race. Talking with BME colleagues and understanding why tackling race discrimination is important. We have to lead by example. We should expect EDI to feature in all board reports and make EDI a key feature of board recruitment and appraisals. We should be as curious about the EDI dashboard as we are about other data. We should expect an explanation of why proposed interventions in recruitment and career progression have a reasonable likelihood of working. We should actively and personally support staff networks. And we should we should be aware that regulation may change, in my view, for the better uh, on this issue. All this will take time. Some quick wins are possible and trusts uh, have demonstrated that. But some of it will take time. But tackling racism is absolutely crucial part of staff recovery, which has to underpin um, service recovery in the current situation. And uh, I'm really, I'm really chuffed that uh, Kevin's following me because, in a number of ways, what he's doing is exactly the sort of thing that um, the research says should be done. So, on that note, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Roger. Really um, interesting. I was like, wow. I was making. I, was make, I know we're going to get the slides. So, everyone, please note you will get a copy of the slides. And, um, you know, but I was I still found myself making some notes of the data and, and some of those really practical things 
that aren't that difficult to implement, but it does take commitment, it does take time. So Roger, thank you so much. Uh, there are some questions that have come through the chat. We're gonna pause on those and, and bring those into the Q&A, um, but I'm delighted to uh, bring on our next speaker. Morning, Kevin, good to have Morning. you here. Kevin is from Imperial College Healthcare, and he's going to be sharing a case study from, from, uh, the, from his trust. So without further ado, over to you, Kevin. Thanks, Sharon. Um, and also sort of thanks Roger as well, because he's been on our journey with us. Uh, he had interactions with Roger uh, almost on day one of my appointment for a different reason, but we've continued to sort of go through this journey at Imperial uh, together. And Roger's been a great uh, supporter as well as a critical friend sort of pushing us and challenges along the way. So, um, yeah, so... Um, there's lots of detail in the slides that I, I'm going to go through because I was asked to sort of provide almost like a practitioner's view and that you want stuff to take away. I'm going to hover over some slides and skip through others, but it means you'll have a lot of the sort of detail that hopefully will be um, useful. So if we can go to the first slide. Um, I will talk about process and data, but I've also got a couple of slides that, I think are really important about context. Not, you can't do this in the isolation from the context of the culture and behaviors in the organization. Um, and whilst this is about process, uh, as Roger's covered as well, uh, we have to address the culture and the behaviors um, as well. So in essence, uh, we're trying to de-bias the process as Roger's described. And we started with the band seven and above um, posts, uh, non-medical posts. And I'll come to the medical, obviously, in, in, in a few minutes. And in essence, we just really made sure that we were tracking what you'd normally expect from a general recruitment process about it being advertised properly, um, clarity about who's on the panel. Uh, but we made sure by that tracking that the panels were diverse for ethnicity and gender, uh, the thing that's been sort of probably most challenging is the Dear Tim letter, which is the letter um, to the chief executive, Tim Orchard, uh, that everybody has to do at the end of a panel that's quite structured and prescriptive about what they have to send. Uh, and as Roger says, the offer doesn't get uh, carried forward unless we've got that dear Tim letter and unless we're happy that that has been done uh, through the process that we have set out. Um, the team meet with myself and Tim, uh, the recruitment team this is, uh, meet with myself and Tim every month and we have a big spreadsheet where we go through every recruitment episode, band seven and above, and we make sure it's matched the process and that it's had the dear 10 letter. But, um, and this also gets tracked at divisional um, and directorate sort of levels as well. Uh, but as Roger also mentioned, one of the key things we've been focusing on is what's happened to the non-successful candidates. And part of what the managers or the chairs of the panels need to outline is what's been done with any internal applicants that were not successful and who is the person who is going to be accountable for being the link to those non-successful people uh, which is usually their local manager uh, not the chair of the panel but um and also the link with our learning and od team to understand what is the need for those individuals and what's available and um, we then introduce this with, for the medical appointments uh, to make sure that all our consultant appointments and our senior um, medical leadership roles are also going through the same process. So um, that's the sort of overview of the process. If I can go to the next slide, I am going to skip through some of these, but it's sort of useful to see some of the data and some of the insights that we're getting. It requires a lot of work from my team and it wasn't popular at the start. Uh, and it also, those Dear Tim letters require a lot from the, the managers, because Tim does read them and he has sent some back. And 
um, we have followed people up about some things that are in the letters. Uh, so it is quite a time intensive process, um, but that is also something to, to think about. So if we can go to the next slide, there's a few slides in the pack, which are just the updates of where we've got to. Um, Imperial is 58% uh, Bane. So we've got a long way to go in terms of both our representation as well as the uh, numbers that we need to hit to redress the inequality that there is already built in. So we're getting towards the 50% mark of, uh, as Roger says, you would expect that it should be at least 50-50, but obviously with 58% bang, we've got to go and redress that. Uh, so um, whilst the most recent data shows that we are getting 50% of our appointments uh, bang from a bang background, we've got to do more work because that just keeps us still. That just sort of stops us backsliding. So if we can go to the next slide, as I say, some of these are for takeaway really, so you can see what we're doing um, rather than um, I'm gonna go through all of the data because they're quite busy. Um, so this is the stuff that me and Tim look at with the, uh, the recruitment team and the divisions. So I'll come to what's in the divisional scorecard in a second. What the one of the things to point out here um, in the BAME offered, you know, as I said earlier on, it's sort of late 30s, mid 40s. Um, and we've now had um, a few months where we've got over 50 percent and uh, November was uh, 50 percent. In the last column, you can see that it was a bit uh, tricky at the start. We've been doing this over a year um, to get people to do the dear, dear Tim letters. And the other thing is the staff network got really um, strong staff networks um, and we did reverse mentoring um, before COVID and actually um, some of that input from the mentors with the execs has been helpful in steering this process as well. And so what you can see in that last column is that, you know, there was issues in the early stages and the staff network help, helped us look at both the process as well as Tim obviously stepping up the accountability. And that's when we also introduced no, no letter, no offer. So um, that, that was where, why we're now getting 99, 98%. And we were totally happy. If it delayed it, fine. It's more important that we get the right person than we get you know, fast KPIs on our recruitment process. So if we go to the next slide, um, just similar data about the, the doctors. Our, our medical workforce is generally more diverse. And so in some ways, there's not been some of the work needed on the face of it, looking at the appointments because there are more applicants that get shortlisted in the medical, on the medical side. So the work on the non-medical side is to try and get the pipeline better and get the process better. Um, but it feels like we've got more applicants in the medical process already just because of the diversity of the workforce. If we can go to the next slide, I'll probably jump a couple here because I want to get onto the most recent. So what you can see here is that we're going through the divisions and what we're doing now is challenging the divisions to say, well, some divisions, you're not actually getting the pipeline right. So you've not got enough people coming through as applicants. And so you need to focus on how you can get more applicants because you're, you're really not giving yourselves a great chance of success if you're not attracting people into the process in, in the first place. Um, if we can go to the next slide, um, so I think there's something here about maintaining this. Uh, and so what we've also had to do, because obviously we don't have the representation at senior levels to be getting those diverse panels just by who you'd normally ask to sit on a panel. And we're very clear, you don't have to be a band 8B to you know, interview for an, uh, a seven post. Uh, I sit on consultant panels. I don't know anything about the clinical side, but I can be a good panel member uh, under certain circumstances. So we've done a lot to train panel members up. 
but they often get seen as the the diverse person on the panel get asked to ask the equalities questions and sometimes had horrendous experiences of people almost then being shuffled out of the decision making process and so you know we've had to do quite a bit to educate the rest of the organization about these panels and the panel members and also you know get the feedback from the panel members so it's not just to sort of set the set it going and just sit back it's a lot of work to actually maintain it and sustain it so if we can go to the um the next slide um i wanted to get to this this is something that's come out over the last few days actually in our emiris work and what i think it highlights but i'll be uh, warned against Roger's um, always going evidence-based practice. But what I took from this, and the reason I wanted to um, sneak it in today, is on the left-hand side, what you've got here um, is the normal representation sort of position, where you can see that uh, what you see in other professions about relatively equal representation at the junior doctor level, that then slides away in the consultants. And obviously that's the challenge that we've got and that's what we see in the non-medical side. I think what this highlights here is the uh, SAS. So if you're not um, familiar with the medical sort of um, roles, um, these are sort of staff grades and associate specialists. And what you can see there, which is sort of anecdotal, what we feel, you know, historically is that perhaps um, the BAME representation is coming through the SAS doctors, but they're not progressing through to those consultant roles. And so we need to do more about the development and the work that we're doing with our SAS doctors. Um, and I can't say that you can see that they, the junior that are in training sort of drop into SAS roles because they may be on different pathways, but that feels like something we need to sort of explore in the medical workforce and it sort of starts to provide some data of things that we think uh is, is sort of we see is that almost the SAS doctors often get used as a sort of service sort of workhorses uh without that professional development and training route and progression into consultant roles and so uh, a bit of a field theory and a bit anecdote but um that um sort of seems so I wanted to share that so if we go to the next slide it's just again the data broken down for the doctors uh, and thinking, just sharing really how we're looking at the MRES, um, you know, work that has been come through uh, in more recent times. Uh, and the next slide, if we can go to that, uh, is for the, the, the consultants and you can start to see again, just a, I'm obviously sharing a lot of data that's not published. So I hope you appreciate that and don't sort of go and publish it. Uh, uh, but that's the rules that I sort of thought we were operating under. The next few slides take us away from the, the, the process and the data, but which I almost think is more important than um, the, the data and the process. Roger might argue with me about this, but um, if we can go to the next slide, and this is very scribbly, but I one of the most impactful things on me, and apart from um, Sharon was on the program telling us about Steph Networks, which was fantastic. The um, Workforce Race Equality Experts Programme, the RES Experts Programme, really sort of made me think, and the reason why we've been prioritising in some ways, RES 2, which is where the sort of inclusive recruitment comes into the process terms. And you probably can't read my writing and I haven't had a chance to sort of type this up since I did it when I was doing the programme. But in essence, I think part of the point it feels to me, that, um... sorry, somebody's, yeah, it feels to me that the recruitment process is the bellwether of whether people think things are fair, as well as the route to making things more fair. I won't go through all of this, but um, the two-way arrows are that if we get better um, processes for recruitment, so if you just set the top middle, if you like, and where I'm linking res two to res one, then better recruitment processes will increase the representation at senior levels of the, um, the workforce that then feeds back down into the arrow that goes the other way, which is you should be then 
getting better representation in your recruitment process and hopefully would be a, a fairer uh, and a more equal process. And the arrows just go through that. So if we take res three, which hopefully people know is about disciplinary processes, if we improve our recruitment processes so that um, more people are senior managers, then that gives us a better chance about our disciplinary processes being less discriminatory. And so it's a bit scribbling. You might be able not to read all my writing, but in essence, that, that feels to me why this issue of fair recruitment um, and inclusive recruitment is such a significant gateway and a route to everything else that we're trying to achieve. And you can map it, I think, to all of the red um, indicators. The next thing, again, uh, I managed to type this one up so it's a bit easier to see if we go to the next slide. Um, sorry, which, um, that's just saying what I've just said verbally, so skip that. So if we go, um, this is just from the Res Experts program and testimonies that I hear. This sort of feels like what I see happens. And just to explain what this, and I think this is also why I think it's not just about the recruitment process and why perhaps some people don't even bother going for the job in the first place. So what you've got here is trying to represent, um, this is almost like a single team with a single manager, uh, a white employee and a BAME employee starting on the same day. So the, the white employee is on the white track and the BAME employee is on the black track. Um, a green virtuous cycle for the white employee um, and a red uh, vicious cycle and downward spiral for the BAME employee. So just thinking about what people tell me and what I actually have experienced in some ways happening is the white employee comes into the team. I'm a white manager. I feel comfortable with the white employee. They have stuff that they talk about outside work that I talk about as well. Sports, going to the pub, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I build more rapport. I feel more comfortable to challenge. They, they develop. I feel more confident to um, talk to them about things. They get offered the, you know, they get the tap on the shoulder that Roger was talking about. Uh, and they go on this upward spiral. I won't go, I haven't got time to go through all of that. But in essence, by the time something comes um, available, this white employee is fully primed, skilled, almost uh, sometimes also knows people on the panel, uh, access to networks and sorted things out. On the other hand, the downward spiral is that the manager doesn't feel so comfortable with the person. They don't talk about things outside work. They don't feel confident about um, challenging behaviours. They don't feel uh, that they necessarily um, can uh, do things that they do for their white um, member of the team. The, the person on the bottom track perhaps has some different ways of speaking, perhaps looks at things, perhaps talks in a different way, perhaps... Um, uh, thinks like it differently, which makes the white manager feel uncomfortable, which means that the, the you know the, the relationship gets deteriorates. By the time we get to the vacancy, the black uh, sorry the main member of staff uh, uh, has basically got the message that they're not going to be successful. They've not been supported. They're not in a position to be, and and the people on the panel are already known to the white member of staff anyway. So what chance are they going to have? So um, it's just a symbol of what I heard when I speak to to people about what feels like can happen. And this is why I think it's really important that uh, it's not just about the um, recruitment process. I'm gonna to have to scoot on because of time. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so I think this is why we have to think, and I, I find this quite helpful as a sort of generic slide about culture, but um, you have to get deep into the organization. So you have to get below the waterline. And so, yes, if you do the stuff that I've showed in the process, and then the data, um, that's fine. But uh, you have to get your feet wet or actually get more than your feet wet and get below the waterline to, to get into some of the stuff around the perceptions, the shared assumptions, the norms, uh, uh, you know, the unwritten rules, the stories, all that stuff we know about culture change. So one of the messages what I wanted to leave you with really is you know, I, you know, whilst we've got all the data and we've got the process and we've got the accountability, this is where, you know, it, we're, we're working as well. And, and if we can go to the 
the next slide. So in terms of inclusive recruitment, there's a number of things that we're working on. We've got lots more to do um, in this area. Um, but if we can go to the next slide, we've got a great workforce information team here. Um, but what we've done, as Roger was um, highlighting earlier, is if you look down the bottom there, we've got uh, three things that this is the this is the trust scorecard. So if you go and look at our board papers, this is the this is the scorecard that goes to our people committee um, that you can see in our board papers. Uh, so we've got three things in there. There's a bit more detail at a directorate and divisional level, but um, there's the band seven and above, and you can see we're still sticking uh, because whilst we are got better at getting the appointments, because we're 58% bank, then we're just you know, treading water rather than, you know, diving in. So and what we've done, though, is we have keep putting the vacancies in because managers will say, well, I haven't got many vacancies at Band 7 and above, so I, I can't do it, you know. So actually, there's over 300 vacancies in the organisation at Band 7 and above, so why aren't we getting more people um, from a Bane background into those posts? It's not about the availability of vacancies. There's plenty of vacancies, so it's something else. You can see there that, as I said on the data, that it's improving. Uh, but we've got a long way to go to redress the, the balance. Just a couple more slides to finish with, just looking at time, is that, uh, if we go to the next slide, um, as I mentioned, this is all part of a wider piece. Uh, again, we've got a great head of uh, EDI um, who sort of leads us with this work. Uh, but and so the inclusive recruitment fits in everything else we are doing uh, about the, you know, we need to do talent management, it's not a deficit model, but we need to support people to develop and we need to do some things differently about our proactive, uh, sorry, positive action in that space. Um, the important elements, just the final slide on the inclusive recruitment. Um, final, the things I probably haven't mentioned already, but I think are important. Uh, as Roger said, or I, yeah, I think it was Roger's, um, that our board is more diverse and one of the big champions is the chair of our people committee, um, Sim Skavatsa. Uh, so our non-executive board membership is more diverse, but our executive membership is still not as diverse. Uh, so um, we've got the people committee uh, with Sim's leadership. Uh, Tim chairs the EDI committee and the divisions have to be account, account for themselves there to the chief executive. Tim's visible. And other, some of the other leaders are visible, but we need to get a broader engagement from the, all of the executive team. Uh, as I said, we've got good, strong networks. The reason Roger was calling me almost on my first day at work was because some of you will know that we had the tragic death of Amin Abdullah, uh, where an independent report identified lots of things, but as Roger pointed out uh, on Twitter, very publicly, uh, there was a race dimension to that that was just not in that independent report. Amin committed suicide after a disciplinary process he shouldn't have even been in uh, with an all-white panel and a lot of white leadership around. So that has also been significant for me and Tim uh, and uh, the organisation. And so I think that some of those things also influence. Uh, we've increased the EDI team. Uh, we've got res experts and white allies. Uh, because uh, we don't have the representation at board level or didn't uh, after I came off the Res Experts program, one of the things I introduced was almost a shadow accountability framework. So we have a race equality steering group that is made up of the senior Bain members in the organisation to hold me and my team to account because we didn't have the accountability at board level until Sim and some of the colleagues arrived. Uh, and we still have our Res Experts uh, group which is one of the most challenging meetings I have every month, where the res experts, again, give me quite a hard time about the progress and the pace and why aren't we doing more. Um, we've got good works of information and not, alas, but not least, we've got people like Roger who help us, um, you know, look at what we're, we're doing. So I'm going to end there. There's a couple of slides about talent management, but my remit was mainly here today about inclusive recruitment. So, um, I've included in the slides, we won't, you won't see them today, but they're in the pack, a repository of materials that's got more detail and things that might be useful, including a workshop that we did with Roger and the board, uh, some of the board members going through all of our 
race equality work just to test ourselves and challenge ourselves about really whether we were doing the things that we think would have the most impact. So you've got a slide deck there of about 20 slides, I think, uh, with a workshop we did with Roger about a year ago, um, which was really helpful. So um, Sharon, Sharon, I'll stop there uh, for the questions. Thank you so much, Kevin, and appreciate you uh, generously um, sharing other material that you've, we've not seen today, but others will find really helpful when they start to peruse that deck. So thank you so much for that. Two fantastic um, presentations, really insightful and interesting. We've got lots of questions. Roger, I'm going to come to you first. Um, this is from Mahmoud Nawaz. Hi, Mahmoud. Nice to see you on here. And um, his question is, uh, as an ed, he's interested in the data that you showed um, BME represented in poor appraisal outcomes and uh, being underrepresented. He was curious as to um, where does that data come from? And it's not something that he's come across uh, at board. So where is that data available? How did you source that data? Oh, sorry, you need to unmute yourself, Roger. Had to... <laughs> So the data, the data comes partly from two trusts mm -hmm. and it partly comes from responses to um, a blog I did a couple of weeks ago on appraisals, which I was flooded with um, senior managers saying, yeah, we know, and, it, and this is anecdotal, but it was lots of anecdotal information. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that that's likely for a number of reasons, um, partly because... Um, appraisals so there's a literature on appraisals so they are bias enters in a number of ways one of the ways it enters is because um the difficulties that sometimes men have having honest conversations with women particularly where feed they, they're worried that feedback might cause upset and particularly where white some white managers are nervous about saying things they think might upset bme people in appraisals, feedback from interviews, you hold back and you give useless feedback. So you say things like, oh, you did uh, you did really well at the interview, but on the day, somebody else was better. I mean, as useful as a chocolate teapot, really. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and then the, what the literature suggests is it also creeps in uh, where you have open box type appraisals, where they are less, they're much more open to stereotypes um, creeping in. And literature also suggests there's some very specific things you could do right. to try to uh, mitigate those risks. And, and the first one is to be really clear about what the criteria are, not ask general open questions, be really specific about criteria. Don't have too many ratings. It's a really interesting research. The smaller the number of ratings, the less chances there is for bias to creep in. The second one is about ensuring consistency. Um, and one way to do that is to have some system of peer review, or alternatively, if you are rating people, you can simply monitor what's going on. And if it's the mm -hmm. case that BME colleagues are overrepresented in at the poorer levels, just have a conversation, ask why. And how can we help? The, how can we help this change? Because it needs to change. It shouldn't be the case. Uh, and the third one is to move away from attaching all the importance to a one-off annual appraisal, and instead do ongoing appraisals yeah. over the year, so people can learn as they go along, like their own improvement journey, rather than at the end of the year saying, "Well, last you know, last Christmas you did this." I can't even remember. <laughs> so it's not surprising that bias creeps in. I don't mm -hmm. think the NHS does systematically collect it. I'm very much in favour of finding ways to collect it. But even if you don't collect it, doing these things can mitigate the likelihood that, of bias yeah. because appraisals are a really key part of people's career development. That is right. beautiful charts that Kevin, I've never seen them before, that mm -hmm. Kevin produced. You could just imagine how appraisals can quite mm -hmm. subtly fit, fit in and, and kind of emphasise that, that, yeah. that exist. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Great question, Mahmoud. Thank you. And great answer, Roger. A couple of people got their hands up. I'm going to come to them. Uh, Nikki. Nikki Clark? Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Uh, Kevin, I think it's a practical question for you around your Dear Tim letters, um, uh, which I've written down uh, and I'm going to look at doing. Um, does How much does it delay the offer going out by? <laughs> so I think, uh, d does 
Tim or you on Tim's behalf, read those letters as they come in and turn them around within 24 hours. I mean, just conscious of time to hire and, uh, and the impact it can have. Before you answer that, Kevin, I'm just going to go to the next person and we'll take those two questions together. And it's come up as Swan Jit. Hi, Sharon. Hello. Good, good morning. It's, um, my name is Swan Jit Singh and I'm the Joint Director of Inclusion and the Trust Company Secretary at Whittington Health. Um, really fantastic presentations and I'm really looking forward to the pack with Tim, with Kevin's materials um, to, to, to review. Two quick questions. One to Kevin was, how did you tackle the resistance to the Dear Tim letters? Uh, to, uh, there's a big culture change for many, I guess. And the secondly, it's more a broader question. Having worked in a number of NHS trusts, particularly for executive director recruitment, organisations usually have stakeholder panels. However, it's never clear as part of good recruitment practice to the candidates what weighting, if anything, those stakeholder panels have in the final selection decision. So is there something about that that needs improvement that we should look at as well? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Swanjit. Two great questions. Kevin, do you want to start off with the uh, delay um, question and the resistance? And then maybe um, you, Roger, come in about stakeholder and waiting. Is that OK? All right. Yeah. So um, the, the offers have, they, they, they can go out if the Dear Tim letter has been done. So it doesn't, it, and we've got a two day time tape you know i mean in some ways it's up to the recruiting manager to get it done but we ask for that to be done within two days it the offer can't go until the dear team letter has been done that monthly meeting that i referred to we get all the letters and all the data and it's then that if something is amiss a that we would follow up with uh, the individuals but the recruitment team are also looking at it to see whether you know if you send a few lines in they know that that's not going to be enough uh, and in terms I mean, of that's the, really helpful uh, and then it's, I think in terms of the tackling resistance I think Tim is just very disciplined you know he is very determined sorry that this will happen and so he's just pursued it and pursued it and he's adamant that it will happen um, and so and, and the putting the offer, stopping the offer before it's done is what was the game changer, really, because people were not doing it. Thank you. Roger? Uh, so um, on, the stake, on the stakeholder one. Yeah. Yes, please. Any thoughts? Uh, so it's, very, it's, it's very common that stakeholder groups are used. I'm not against them, but I, I'm always curious as to who is selected? Um, what what weight is given to what's said, and how that's aggregated in terms of any feedback into an interview process, and the risk that the stakeholder groups themselves are prone to bias, and there can be all sorts of biases. One of the ones is um, there's some lovely research showing how panels, and I can imagine this applies to stakeholder groups too, confuse competence with confidence. So you can come along and still snow, snow to the Eskimos, but is that really what the trust wants you to do when you get into your job? So, and I think that that there's a risk there that that could disadvantage women, and it could also disadvantage BME colleagues and colleagues with disabilities, who may be a little bit more prone to suffer from imposter syndrome, a bit more nervous, and are judged as not being good candidates on that basis, rather than any kind of in-depth understanding of what their potential might be. So I'm not against them, but but with great caution, I would say. Kevin, did you do you use stakeholder panels where in your as part of your recruitment process? And is what waiting is given and 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 are the candidates told about that up front? Yeah, we do use them for senior appointments, but I think that um, it's unsatisfactory from that perspective because I right. think it's sort of, I think it falls into the trap that Roger's just described. It's, it's an area that we need to do work on. Okay. And what about psychometric tests? A couple of people have been asking about that. Do you use that as part of your recruitment process? We don't, but interestingly, we've just started to think about whether we should. 
Uh, but we don't at the moment. Right. Okay. Thank you. I can see Amanda Lee has got her hand up. Amanda? Well done. Hi, just trying to unmute myself. Hi. Um, this is uh, just a, mainly an observation, and it's probably um, to Roger. You know, when we when we talk about the Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups and how we're, we're doing the monitoring, where we say that, for example, SAS doctors, you know, don't fear very well as they go through the progress um, through, through to um, through the different ranks. It would be interesting to see how well um, different groups within that BAME acronym actually um fear because of course Roger you you know me from previous role but um when we looked at the data at the BMA previously actually there was more of an issue with black doctors um rather than the Asian doctors so I'm always very concerned by any of the outcomes <coughs> that come from the NHS in terms of aggregating all of the the, those groups together rather than pulling them apart so that we actually get to the root cause of who is underrepresented in these groups. So SAS doctors are predominantly South Asian, I believe. I, I, I haven't looked exactly into the full data, but there still seems to be a stark underrepresentation of Black doctors, of um, not so much in the nursing profession, but Possibly, I, I would suggest it's the same in doctors. And how are we overcoming that when we look at interventions? Because until we break it down, that's what I think is stalling and skewing some of that information. Do you do do you think there's any possibility of us ever breaking that down moving forward? Because it's still very black and white. Because if you lump everybody together, all we're really talking about it is black and white. So shall I, shall I respond, Sharon? Um, so two things. When the res was created back in 2014, um, and I can assure you there was a lot of pushback there and uh, Simon mm -hmm. Stevens had to do what Tim Orchard is doing in Imperial. Um, we, we decided to try and make it simple whilst recognising the shortcomings. And it, and it was very effective, I think, in terms of saying, hey, we have a problem and, and forcing organisations to sort of look at their own data. But you're absolutely right. It's not quite as straightforward as black and white. And what trusts are starting to do, and some of Kevin's data, data, uh, data I think, will show this, but other trusts as well, you can start to track the different, the, what, what are the specific obstacles that are facing African applicants, for example, who I think probably have the worst deal of all. Um, and as we get more as we get more confident about this and we are we have better data systems, we ought to be able to drill down more effectively and recognize that there are differences in the same way there are differences between BME women and BME men. Mm -hmm. um, so we do need to get to, and some trusts are starting to do that. I think one challenge going forward, is how we kind of systematize that and come up with some standardized way of doing it. But I think trusts are, I think quite a lot of trusts are recognizing that's an issue and I think they're right to do so. So I think I think it will come, but I would I would defend what we did originally on the grounds we have to start somewhere and you have no idea of the resistance that there was originally to it. I, I can just imagine the resistance in the same way that I can imagine the resistance to those team, those Tim letters, because um, I've suggested a similar um, intervention at UCLH. And the, the comeback was, oh, my goodness, who would be able to do that? But I actually think if you're willing, you, you, you are definitely able. And this is testament. So this was really quite an insightful um, presentation. I'm glad I came along. You both have been brilliant. <laughs> If I might say, research makes it absolutely clear why they work. Absolutely. Thanks, Amanda. Lots of people are agreeing with your, um, your statement there about the need to disaggregate the data and, and so on. Just a, a couple more about the diverse panels, if I may. Um, you know, Kevin, in terms of the diverse panel members, how are they selected? And, and someone was asking whether you have patients or community reps involved and 
how effective are they in, in actually, you know, because there's comments in the, in the chat about they need to have the confidence to challenge or to put their views forward. And sometimes that's often missing. So over to you for that one. Yeah. So, again, we work very closely with our staff network. And the reason I say networks is because we have a, um, a multidisciplinary race equality network and then we have a nursing and midwifery one, a doctor's one, just so that the professional and, and the different groups and the admin and clerical one. So that's why I say that but the race equality networks that we have, they, they were really you know, challenging us about this whole process and how we make sure this happens, uh, you know, appropriately. So what we did was we sort of invited offers, you know, in expressions of interest, and particularly uh, the, the staff networks promoted that uh, to encourage people to come forward. Then we trained uh, the, sort of the first cohorts around some of the basics, but also what that, this role is about. Ah, oh, okay. Um, and so that's how it sort of worked. There's guidance. I think we've got guidance as part of that training about what a diverse panel is, why you have a diverse panel. Uh, the thing that I mentioned in the presentation, the sticking point has been that these people have been just almost seen as uh, a person that's sitting there to, to be the diverse person and that's ticked the box for having the diverse person and we've had as I said some pretty cool feedback about some of the behaviours of other panel members and so we've almost then started to have to train other people about the member of the panel that is there um, from a diverse perspective um, so that that's how that works I don't know whether I answered all your questions there actually no I think you did I think you did well, look, time has is far spent and I did promise that we would finish on time, didn't I? And um, I'm sure you all agree that the, you know, this session has been absolutely fantastic. It's just practical as well as, you know, uh, teaching us some things, sharing lots of knowledge from both um, Roger and Kevin. So thank you both so much for giving up your time and sharing from your perspectives. It's been really um, useful and judging by the comments on the chat. Everyone agrees with that. So huge thank you for, for uh, you know, sharing your thoughts today. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed this morning. Um, I think it's been a really interesting session. And given my role as, as vice chair of a CECOL group, of course, this is the type of thing we want to hear about, more practical things, what's happening. And what it does tell me is that there are things that we can do. There are, there's so much more we can do. And when you're prepared to sacrifice the time and put in the effort, you can start to see the results. And we've got a great, we've had a great case study here from Imperial. So thank you all so much for that. I think uh, NHS providers would love it if you could take time to fill in the evaluation form. There should be a link in the chat or following up today. Um, the slides as well as a link to this recording will be sent afterwards so you can take time and, um, you know, review it and share it with colleagues and, and discuss it with them. And um, yeah, any any thoughts, any feedback, please send them back to NHS providers so they can uh, uh, take, take note of that. So if you can all come off mute and give Kevin and Roger a great round of applause, that would be wonderful. <laughs> And just one more, just one word from anyone, just put it in the chat how you found today. That would be really good. Just put in a, a, a thought or a word of, of how you would describe this session and we can capture that as well. But Kevin, Roger, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing your thoughts. And hopefully we'll see you both again about how things have progressed. So thank you. There. On the screen there, you can see some other things coming up. So you've got some uh, more, more programs on this agenda. On the 27th of February, look at that. Peer learning event, race equality and inclusive recruitment. Um, we're also going to do um, some another event on the 7th of March, uh, supporting our internationally educated workforce. That sounds fantastic. And can we talk about race? I think we can. <laughs> and that's taking place on the 14th of March. So those are some dates there for your diary. So don't make, uh, make sure you don't miss out on those. 
Okay, that's it from me, Sharon and Kotaria. And on behalf of Kevin, Roger, and um, NHS providers, thank you so much. And I'll see you again soon. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you.